Live from Fairfax, it's the Inside Scoop Virginia. All the news Virginians want to know. Here's your host. Welcome. This is Inside Scoop Virginia. My name is Bettina Lawton, and I'm your partial host tonight, because those of you who watch in the alternate weeks will recognize Mark Levine is with us. Mark does the national production of Inside Scoop, but he is joining us because, of course, in Virginia, we just had elections on Tuesday, and we have got all kinds of great questions. And those of you who watch Mark regularly know that he is a constitutional aficionado. And so we have him here. We're going to talk about some voter suppression stuff, some dirty trick stuff. I'm but ready. He's ready. He's got his constitution right. with him. Uh, but in the middle, you will notice there is someone else, and that is Brian Moran. Brian is the chair of the Democratic Party of Virginia, and he is a former House of Delegate member, and he's here. We're going to talk about what happened in Virginia. And what happened in Virginia, part of it is still up for debate. There's a 2020 tie in the Virginia Senate. Uh, We didn't do very well at all in the House of Delegates. We're down to 33 or 34 uh, Democratic House of Delegate members. Too few. Too few. Way too few. Um, much fewer than when you actually were the caucus chair and out recruiting people. But let's go back to the Senate because that's the big issue. Mm -hmm. There is some dispute about whether or not the Republicans get to control the Senate because it's a 2020 tie. I'm sure you've been studying it. What's the uh, answer? I've spent today reading several attorney general's opinions, Bettina, and frankly, the will of the voters should be followed here. It's a 2020 Senate. It's a tie Senate. And uh, despite uh, Republicans claiming they have complete control, that's just not the case. And there should be power sharing. And I hope that the Senate is able to, uh, you know, appeal to their better instincts and share power. And if that's not the case, then I think we should uh, pursue all avenues necessary to make sure that uh, power sharing is uh, is, uh, achieved. Brian, well, uh, what, there happened once before there was a split in the mm-hmm. Senate in 2020, and although the Virginia Constitution says that the lieutenant governor cast the deciding vote, at that time there was a split, right? Committees were right. equally... Uh, so does this set a precedent for today? Mm. I think it does. Uh, it's not a legal precedent, however. It was uh, that power sharing came to be because of a Democratic uh, state senator, Virgil Goode, decided to impose himself into the uh, deliberations and say, I'll, I'll caucus with the Republicans if you don't share power. And he said this to the Democrats, so the Democrats said, all right, let's, we're going to share power. I would hope that now a Republican would follow suit and say, well, we should share power. It's a 2020 Senate. You don't really think yeah. that's going to happen, uh, yeah, yeah, right? okay. I mean, you know this party very well. <laughs> uh, former candidate for governor, you've been in the House delegates for, I don't know, more than a decade, I think. Uh, is this the kind of... Republican Party that's going to be willing to share power? Let's be honest. Well, evidently not, because the first news conference Bill Bowling had, the lieutenant governor, along with the governor and the, and the um, speaker of the House, and immediately said, we're, we're in charge. And, you know, it's kind of like Alexander Haig. Remember Alexander sure. Haig playing, I'm in charge. Well, that's not actually the Secretary of State's position. And I don't think it should be Bill Bowling's position or the Republican position. It's a 2020 tie. This, the voters of Virginia have spoken. They like uh, divided government and uh, Virginia indeed is a you know battleground state. It's 50-50, and uh, we, they should legislate uh, accordingly. Well, on the night of the election, when a reporter asked Senator Chap Peterson this, he said, "We ought to sue them." Mm-hmm. Is well, the Chap's part- a Chap's a first-class litigator. That's well, this first is thing. Let's sue. Uh, good for Chap. I've, I've, uh, if necessary, that uh, you know, first obviously we have to determine whether or not we have sufficient legal grounds for the lawsuit. Hopefully, though, I appeal again to their better instincts and and come up with a plan of shared uh, responsibility and shared power. But if uh, if that does not succeed, then if we do have sufficient legal grounds, then uh, the courts would be an avenue. What is the effect? Because we've we've had a situation in Virginia where the House of Delegates would pass, was in Republican control, still is, um, would pass all kinds of bizarre legislation. It right. would get to the Senate and the Senate would kill it. Correct. Yeah. And now depending on how this mm-hmm. sharing mm-hmm. takes place or doesn't take place, mm-hmm. what kind of legislation might we be looking at? The people of Virginia, what do they need to look well, at? Well, that's why the power sharing is important, because the committee, uh, as they are composed and structured, they're odd uh, votes, because a bill fails on a tie vote. bill fails on a tie vote. So the committees are split eight to seven odd numbers. 
so that a bill, you know, obviously eight, eight, majority of eight rules and the, it goes to the floor of the Senate. So the power structure really is important when it comes to the, local, the individual committees. Uh, previously, I believe what they did is they gave Republicans majority of certain committees and then uh, Democrats majorities on other committees. At the so time when it was a 50-50 split the before? The prior time it was 50-50. So they, they didn't actually divide the committees 50-50, because I remember they did that in the U.S. Congress. Right. Back when uh, Jeffords switched, uh, I was in, working in Congress at that time, oh, and, right, we, and we, right, had, yeah. we had a 50-50 split, right. uh, even though Vice President Cheney, of course, was Republican yeah, Vice yeah, President. Yeah. Uh, did well, uh, I was uh, serving in the House at the time. I believe that was the case, but uh, and they had co-chairs, but the numbers worked. Um, maybe they worked evenly. You know, I, I'm, I'm not positive of that. But currently, how it would work if, if the Republicans are somehow able to exert control, uh, the committees would go eight to seven, and they would make the determination. So all those bills that we were also concerned now, about as Democrats would bills? actually get to the yeah. floor. But, but the, the, oh, the fetus talking side about. and, and well, let's, anesthesia. Well, let's talk about it because uh, Women's anesthesia rights, gay for rights fetus would be turned it, back. I mean, fetuses have no pain receptors until way, way late in the in, in the pregnancy. So you're requiring anesthesia for something that can feel no pain, presumably just to make it more expensive and to take away one's right to choose. I don't think that would be constitutional. Well, I, I don't think they the, could ram it through. Uh, the the the, uh, the clinic uh, bill that was just became law, the Commonwealth. I don't believe is constitutional because what you've done is imposed regulations, burdensome regulation that are unnecessary regulations because the health needs of those regulations has not been proven. Yeah, there's no and you'd close, you'd close all but two clinics in this commonwealth. So uh, I would interpret that to mean you're really overturning Roe versus Wade, which stands for the proposition a woman had, should have the right to choose during the first trimester. The state interest increases as you go on into the into the term, but the first trimester, it's a woman's right to choose to make that decision, and you're overturning it because you're making access, you're denying access. Uh, you know, for re for Republicans to impose that based on some sort of it's interesting, of course, the, uh, irony, of course, is that they're opposing the president's health care legislation right. because it's burdensome regulations. But if right. but if it's their abortion, regulations, they, they like they want to so. But regulation. abortion, uh, environmental, uh, what are some regular, uh, environmental protections, I think, are going to be gutted. I think you're going to see a real uh, effort to drill off the coast. I think you're going to see money uh, 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 cut for cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. We're going to have uranium mining in Southwest. Well, that uh, you know that's interesting uh, because you, I think you're going to have some regional conflicts there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're going to you might get some Republican support from those who are directly impacted. But that that obviously is an important environmental issue in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that will be debated this legislative session. So, what are we going to see on immigration? Education cuts, though. Let's. I mean, oh, that's something that's very passionate. Uh, the governor proposed $700 million right. in education cuts, and the Senate restored them. You know, uh, we've fallen with, in the, in the two years since uh, the governor took control and the Republicans, uh, they had, uh, we've gone from third best in the nation for small class sizes, the ratio between your teachers and your students, to 41st. We've fallen from thir third to 41st. Wow. That's, you know, that's not. Just since Tim Kaine was we, governor? No, no, since Tim Kaine was here? Yeah, because yeah, we made that investment in public education under Mark Warner in 2004. Bob McDonald did not support it. And frankly, since he's been in, he seems to have been trying to repeal it ever since. Uh, this is education, environment, uh, rights, a number of rights. and uh, Yeah, they're very concerning. And that's why whatever avenues are necessary to get a power-sharing agreement, I think we should avail ourselves of those uh, you know, avenues. I have a question about the nature of the 2020. One of the magical things about having a tie is it gives every single senator a tremendous amount of power. And uh, you know the Senate uh, far better than I do. I, uh, are there Republicans that might vote with the Democrats? Are there Democrats that might vote with Republicans? How partisan is the caucus? How likely are people to cross over and make that yeah, deciding I, vote? I think everyone's asking that question right now. <laughs> I mean, you have some new members of the Senate, like Dick Black. I served with him in the House. He's a very partisan individual. I mean, he's very always going to vote for the Republicans. That's very clear. conservative right, individual. Right. Um, but are there moderates in either party well, that might cross hope, over? You'd hope some would surface. Uh, we certainly had moderates in the in, a de in the day when uh, they supported Mark Warner and his education investments. John Chichester was one, for example. Even Ken Stolle from Virginia Beach was one. Are any of these they're both gone. No, the they're I mean, both gone. It doesn't sound so, like you're very optimistic. I'm not optimistic. Okay. No, I, I think we. I, I How about Democrats might vote for Republicans? Might we lose some? No, I think that's that caucus. What they went through with this election has really bonded them. 
Yeah, so it's yeah. going to be lots of 2020 votes, I think you think? See. Well, and, and, and what we haven't mentioned, if it is a 2020 vote, uh, there is some authority for the purpose of the lieutenant governor breaks the tie. And uh, so that's why the committee, construct, committee structure is very important, because we don't want the bills to even reach the floor for a 2020 vote. Um, so no, it, it's going to be provide a lot of um, interesting votes and, and discussions and parliamentary procedure. And the Senate's going to have to really, the Democrats going to have to really be ready parliamentary uh, wise to make sure that uh, votes are not cast on that floor and get into situations where we lose votes. What's your sense of may, You know, we could always ask somebody to be absent on a particular day when there's a vote. You know, there's, there are there are there are things that we're going to get uh, to dirty tricks happen. later <laughs> later in the broadcast. Please, not not, not not not. We're not here yet. Somebody in the restroom. Well, we got a vote coming. But there's uh, and also about in all seriousness, right? It is a, that's why we worked all so hard, uh, worked so hard to maintain you know a clear Senate majority, um, and came up with a tie. What now, Lieutenant Governor Bowling? Yes. Uh, this is his second term, and so everyone thought that he was going to run for governor, and then he stepped aside very nicely when McDonald decided to run. But now he says he's going to do this. So right. what? Now he's actually got to have votes. Right now, right. nobody could tell you what yeah. Bowling believes because he's just is a ribbon right. cutter. Right. If he has to take actual votes, is this going to be something where people in the party will try and not have him? have to vote on really controversial measures? Or do you think he's going to be saying, this is great, I can distinguish myself from mm -hmm. Ken Cuccinelli? How do you think he's going to play it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a fascinating question, because uh, with Ken Cuccinelli obviously on the far right side, yeah. that his uh, narrative is, is clearly written. Conservative, opposed to the president every step of the way. I mean, that Even opposed to his own governor to that's, the right he's, of, he's, of McDonald's. Right. Conservative. That, Bill Bowling still can be defi defined. I mean, our candidate in 2013 can define him, or he can start defining himself now. And it'll be interesting to see how he takes these votes and how he positions himself. If 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 Cuccinelli is running, I assume he's going to position himself to the, go right. But if Ken's not running, he has the chance to appear more moderate, like Bob McDonald Ken's attempted running. to do. Ken's running. Is there any yeah, I was doubt? Say, how, on. And how much further right can you get yeah, from yeah. Ken Cuccinelli? That's kind of yeah, my there's not a, There's not a lot there's of room over there. When you go off the cliff. He pretended to be in the middle. I remember that. Yeah, that, he pretended. That was a very different Ken Cuccinelli. Yeah, yeah, once he got elected. Although, during the election, we all kept saying to folks, don't be deceived. These right. are not moderate people. Well, I hear the music, which means we are going to go to break. And so I want everybody to stay with us. We're going to come back for more conversation with Brian Moran. Sure. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 guys. Stop, stop playing. No. About 127 seconds. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia.
Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton. I'm the, as I said earlier, partial host today. We also have with us Mark Levine. And in the middle, trapped yeah, in the middle, I, I, is Brian Moran. Right. Right. <laughs> you are. You re, we have you surrounded. Yeah, no? Absolutely. And we're going to keep on talking about what happened in Virginia. And um, I know that one of the questions that we had, Mark mentioned it, was the issue of we drew the map. And we... What was with that? I mean, the way all the media reports were were that the Republicans would have complete control over the House of Delegates map, and they they certainly succeeded. They have the highest number I believe they've ever had in Virginia history. They have two-thirds. They can actually pass a constitutional amendment all by themselves. So they did very well in drawing their lines. We were supposed to draw our lines. I happen to like uh, Dick Slashlaw a lot. Why didn't we get better lines? I mean, it's a tough question. I mean, well, well, what happened? let's, Let's keep in mind that we are... 865 votes from having a 22 seat Senate majority. 865 votes. That's all it took. That's I know. Took. I remember the votes for the 60 votes for the Richard for the Hauk no, race. It, it, it about 200 turned out to be about 200 votes in um, in Ed Hauk's race in Central uh, Virginia. And the other, 600 and away. And Roscoe Reynolds was about 800, uh, 665. So, so it's low. It's 865 low turnout. 865 votes. Well, that's another issue. But let's let's uh, 865 votes separated us from a 22 seat majority, which was always the Senate's goal. Let's get this 22 states. Can we have drawn the lines a little bit better to include well, a thousand voters? You know, <laughs> Hindsight's 2020 to use it. Well, there might have been a and couple it, of more precincts in that house. At, see, I, I come at this, I've always been a big supporter of bipartisan or nonpartisan redistricting. I agree, uh, but if they're going to do it on their side, we should at least get it on our you side. Have to, you know, if that's the game ball you're going to play with, you better right. play in the same game. That's right. So uh, they drew the lines. And, you know, let's uh, George Barker's race in Alexandria. Yeah. You know, uh, if they didn't do that, would we have George Barker? Uh, he is now my state senator in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, and we'd love to have him there. He came out of Alexandria City with a 2,500 vote majority. We had 4,000 votes in Alexandria. He, 2,500 of them came out of. So he, he went into Fairfax and Prince William with a large lead. And I think he won just about a little over 2,500. So uh, in some cases it worked, worked and worked. Where I live in Alexandria, there was no shortage of votes for Adam Evan. I think he won 70 something percent of the vote. I never miss an election, but uh, as someone who, underst- I mean, I understand the way these lines work, I wouldn't have minded splitting up Alexandria a little bit more and, and Adam, into Prince William. Because Adam's, Adam, Adam's a great too. guy. Adam, Adam's he, didn't, a he didn't need player. that many he votes. Would've... He would have won with, he, with less. He would probably have been happy to have given some. But, uh, you know, they drew these lines, and and, um, and that's how we came up, and we ended up with 20. And, Does uh, that, did these lines 865 mean, votes, though, split. Did those, I mean, these lines mean that the Democrats have a good shot of recapturing the Senate in uh, 2015, yeah. 2019? Well, there's a lot of storylines coming out of it. Tina's shaking her head. I'm shaking my head. She did. There's if a we, lot we, of... We have a lot of older folks in the Senate who have been in, and they've been fabulous senators for a lot of years. But a lot of the area, some of that area in the southern part of the central part, if those folks who have a lot of credibility and are Democrats decide not to run, I think that's where we're going to get into the question about well, recruiting. There's good, there's, How there's, do we you know, keep those seats? There's good news and bad news from Tuesday, and we can, we can talk about both, obviously. The good news is that we did real well in Fairfax County in oh, Northern yeah. Virginia. We kept all of those seats. I mean, not there were Republicans out there. In fact, there's an infamous blogger that claimed we were going to lose the Senate. I think he's 75% chance that we were going to lose the Senate. Right. The, we won Barbara Favola. That was supposed to be close. It ended up not very close. Not close. Uh, Toddy Puller, he's, she survived. Jeff Frederick, an energetic candidate, won up handsomely. Uh, George Barker, Dave Marsden, uh, obviously Janet Howell, Dick Sasla, Chap, all did well. So we won those seats, all right? So, and then Hampton Roads is the other large voting jurisdiction for any statewide candidate. We won those seats. John Miller, Ralph Northam. We're supposed to have tight races. We won them. And we actually won in southwest Virginia with Phil Puckett. So, and, and in Roanoke area with uh, John Edwards. So, you know, the good news is that we won in the population areas that any statewide candidate needs to win. Like Tim Kaine will but, be but running this year. Yeah, he I mean, needs to win in northern Virginia. He runs to Hampton Roads. He needs to get a share of his vote out of Richmond and, and in southwest Virginia. We won those areas. So, okay. you know, that's the good news. But we, we have two Democratic senators uh, in, uh, you know, of course, Warner and Webb. Uh, okay. we, United States we, senators. We, United yes. States senators. We have a, we, we had uh, two Democratic governors. Now we have a Republican governor. 
Is something happening in Virginia to change us from purple to red? Should, I mean, well, uh, Virginia I voted for Obama 50, in 2008. 50, 50, 50 no, but the house, shade the house, as red as that. Well, the house is two-thirds. Oh, red, purple. The house is two-thirds. We are a battleground why can't, state. My question is this. If we can elect Democratic candidates statewide, and clearly Virginia can do that and has done that repeatedly, and they, of course, went for President Obama in 2008, why can't we elect Democrats? I mean, I'm not just looking at the Senate. Look at, look at the House. Two thirds, one third? That's ridiculous for a so called purple state. Why can't we elect them in these local races? Is it turnout? Is that I, the problem? I, I think we did okay. elect all Democrats, right. first of all, Mark. So I'm not going to agree entirely with your premise. That's fine. We, we did well. You know, we captured Fairfax County, and there were races that were supposed to be extremely right. tight, and they weren't. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the other fact where we didn't do so well, and uh, largely attributable to turnout. And I, I would suggest to you, when, when the turnout's higher, like with President Obama, overwhelmingly, when we won. I mean, yeah, but people Brian, turned we, out. There were we at about least 30... 47 House of Delegate seats where we didn't run anybody. Yeah. You can't, and you said this when you ran for chair of yeah. the party, you said you lose 100% of the shots you don't, you don't have anybody run, take. No. And we didn't run people in yeah. 47 yeah. out of 100 seats. Yeah. No, you, can't, crazy. you can't have that. 47 out so that of 100 leads me seats, to, no one ran? No one ran. And yeah. in the Senate, we ran, I think, 25 out of 40. So, I mean, you can't. You can't. You had. We had to run the table in order to maintain yeah, they, actual numerical and, control in the Senate. We had no chance of taking over the House as a practical matter. So, well, which moves to my question, mm -hmm. which is, where's the bench? Yeah. How are we recruiting people? What are the plans? We yeah. can't. I, we can't win if we don't, don't run people. Correct. Uh, you just said a lot, so let me take it a little <laughs> slow. Uh, couldn't agree more with you. We need more candidates. Uh, though I will say, in the competitive districts, we did have candidates. Mm -hmm. There was a newly drawn district in Loud and Prince William. We had Sean Mitchell, strong Ooh, candidate. Great candidate. Uh, Bert Dodson in Central Virginia, right. newly drawn district. We had a strong candidate. So we got, in those districts that were uh, competitive versus, you know, Democrat, not leaning Democrat, but, you know, within a margin of error, we had good candidates. Same with the House, frankly. Uh, we had Eric Klinging up here, Mike mm -hmm. Kondratik running in an open seat. Um, so we actually had some Esteban Garces and Prince William. That was a new, newly drawn seat with Stafford. So, uh, and there were other ones around the state. So we we actually had some candidates who were in competitive areas and and didn't win. Now, uh, in terms of candidate recruitment, I do feel like whatever whoever the general manager was for the Nationals when he took over, it's like, okay, what? <laughs> tell me where's the Triple A team? Where's the Double A team? Where's the Single A exactly. team? Right? We have Drive to build it. an infrastructure. And well, you were kind enough to join Jim and help us with our first summit. Mm -hmm. uh, and a large part of the summit that we held as a party this summer was to help candidates. We had a, several candidates come and be trained in how to run a campaign. Also, we had individuals who came and de decided to be a candidate. Right. We actually had candidates running this fall that went to the summit and decided to be candidates. We have to do that. I mean, yeah, that was like, a great event. It's like the, uh, you know, the grapefruit league here. We, we need to get candidates in and start developing the farm team. Uh, now, is that the DPVA's job, or is that the state county job, or the county committee job, well, the caucuses? Who? I'm very confused by who's supposed to be yeah, there doing are, this. And I think most of your viewers are, because some of the emails I've been getting, or the, the Facebooks I've been reading, oh, it's yeah. like, well, you know, there's a Senate caucus that recruits candidates for the Senate and supports them financially. I mean, Dick Saslaw and the rest of the Senate did a great job finan financing them. There's the House caucus. When I served as House caucus chair, it's currently Ken Plum. They recruit House candidates and support them. And then there's the Democratic Party of Virginia. So you got this three groups, and sometimes we work well together. Other times, you know, when there's a statewide candidate, it's a lot easier to bring everybody together because it's a coordinated campaign. We're all working out there. You know, what this year it'll be for Tim Kaine. Um, is, the, is the problem that there's a surplus of candidates in, I mean, I, again, I, I'm from Alexandria, where you could, you could find a more a bluer, <laughs> more democratic place right. in Alexandria. Well, there's only so many Republican. Senate seats or House seats in Alexandria, and, and, and we're full. Uh, we, I, got to, I, I happily <laughs> voted for David England that man. Couldn't pick two, two more progressive, wonderful... Uh, we need Democrats. a relocation well, program for but, Democrats. But, but because, well, and, uh, and a lot of the, 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 re, the reading the criticisms on Facebook, they're folks that live in Arlington. Now, yeah. I love Arlington. It's blue. There's right. lots of candidates, right. so but if you, you want, come you, out, we, you want us you know, to move west, south, go, west. Is that what you're to spots, us? Come to Spotsylvania with me. Come to Shenandoah Valley. Come to the south, Great Southwest with me. When you sit down with a candidate and say, "Yes, we would like you to run for the House of Delegates," yes, you are going to have to take six months away from your family and your business. 
You're also going to have to raise, mm, you know, probably a quarter of a million dollars. And it's a district you probably can't win. Now, I wouldn't say the latter because I think with good candidates, anybody can win. Uh, but, you know, the truth of the matter is these people look at the Democratic performance of the district. It's 39, 40 percent. I have to do all of that. I mean, it's not a tantalizing offer so it's, that I'm making. So it's, a <laughs> you know, it's, it's a like, geographic problem, uh, right? I mean, it's still Northern Virginia and, everybody and, the, well, that's and why the rest I think of Virginia. I've always been in favor of bipartisan redistricting. Like, let's throw it you know, to a commission to draw these lines. I think they'd be more competitive. Shenandoah Valley, it is tough, I mean, to run as a Democrat. Uh, you know, with that de-affiliation, you know, when the Republicans first took control in 1999, I was in the House, and one of their first pieces of legislation was to identify candidates, the party affiliation. See, before then, a lot of rural Democrats sure. had been opposed to party identification because they didn't think they could win right. with a D next to their name. Well, since 99, uh, you know, they passed that law, and we have party, party identification now. And in a lot of parts of this Commonwealth, you know, the D next to your name along Shenandoah County, particularly, it's tough. So. But should we, we need to build a bench. We, we, we need to do more recruitment. We're going to have that summit again this year and expand it. And I'd welcome all those folks who are talking about recruiting. Please contact us. We need more candidates. We have, uh, we have to start at the local level, too. I really want to energize the uh, local elected officials like your you know, county board of supervisors, your constitutional officers, and get them organized because, you know, they can then run for the state senate or, or, or the House of Delegates. Of course, we will have to have a relocation campaign then into Loudoun since there are no uh, Democrats. Selected. That's a real shame because we, we won. Uh, David Passan beat Dick Black right. years ago, and that was a great race. Loudoun was having lots of Democrats. I know. We were, we were on what, a roll. What happened in Loudoun County? Mm -hmm. What do you think happened in Loudoun County? Uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know. I've talked to the chairman there. I've talked to uh, a lot of the great uh, the county board of supervisors members there who are terrific. Uh, we're going to have to investigate that because that's where Democrats have to win. Sure. We need to win the exurbs louder than Prince William. We have, and we, used and we to, win and that we talk, talking about smart growth policies, smart right. economic right. Uh, opportunities and, and growth. Education. I mean, the whole eastern half of loudness completely different. All of those different issues that, that we talk ago. about that should resonate in Prince William, and, and they, they resonate in Fairfax. They work in Fairfax. We we have to really, you know, it's. I don't think it's a simple answer about loud, and that's why I'm really not. I, mean, I think we need to do a focus group on loud, and why are those ex-urban voters going Republican and voting for someone like Dick Black, who doesn't represent? There's no, that county is not as conservative as Dick Black is. Why are they Few voting for Dick Black? Few people are. <laughs> <That's very laughs> <exciting>. Touche. <laughs> the same well, thing. Well said. <laughs> it's very tough. Well, that's, a, that's a, definitely a county that you need to take a look at. Yeah. And I don't know what the split on power is and what you can actually do with that committee, but something needs to be done. Stay with us. We're going to come back for our last segment with Chairman Brian Moran. Osama bin Laden calls getting nuclear weapons a religious duty. Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother. My son. My sister-in-law. Were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation. Under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone, or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria. A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while safety gear offers some protection,
An up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Welcome back. This is our last segment with Chairman Brian Moran of the Democratic Party of Virginia. And we're going to talk some more about uh, messaging, because I want to talk about messaging. Good. The Democratic um, message machine, certainly at the national level, you hear people criticize it all the time. And I know the DPVA has... Um, We've had our share of criticism as well. You have, <laughs> and, and I looked at the website before the show tonight to say, what's the Democratic message mm. on there? There's a lot of anti-Bob McDonald stuff. There's, mm. of course, a ton of anti-Cuccinelli, because that's just... That's too shots. easy. I mean, exactly. That's too just easy. so easy to do. But where where's going to be the positive message? Mm -hmm. Does the mm -hmm. party there? There's this dispute raging on the blogs about the DPVA should be coming up with messaging versus the candidates are doing the messaging. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that well, all falls? Do we need something more forward and positive as opposed to just mm -hmm. criticizing um, Bob McDonald and mm -hmm. Cuccinelli? Well, I, I think it's twofold. I think we have to do both. Uh, let me address Bob's. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. In terms of the, the message, we, um, as a party, we're there to elect Democrats, though. You know, I mean, this isn't about me. It's not about DPVA. It's about getting Democrats elected. Right. And so, you know, whatever message we promote uh, must coincide with our Democratic candidates to help them. I mean, we, we don't want a, certainly not a dis dispute or, or, or a difference of opinion. So as we approach 2012, we're very supportive of Barack Obama and his jobs plan, um, some of which I suspect Virginia Democrats aren't necessarily all, we don't embrace everything he is, but we're going to be out there promoting right. the president. We're also going to be out there promoting Tim Kaine. And that's what the party, we help it, elect Democrats. It, now, it, on the, Trump, the, the Bob McDonald thing is, is very interesting because his poll numbers, Bettina, are huge. Yeah, they're at 65 percent. That's because he hasn't had to, to decide whether to elect to sign on to some of those Republican bills. Or well, that's. <laughs> I'd be careful what you ask for. Once we start getting fetal uh, anesthesia bills for the right. Senate, he may have some. His, his poll ratings no. may go down. Be careful what you ask for, and he's going to he, he's going to be defined by that legislation as well. But but another thing is, a lot of Democrats. In the polling, support Bob McDonald. African Americans support yeah. Bob McDonald. So that's because they don't know a what party, he's done, or he hasn't. Well, as a party, I think we have a responsibility to be critical. Now, I, when I uh, ran for this position, uh, I said I don't want to be shrill. You know, this isn't about being anti-Bob, but we do have anti-Bob policies. I mean, I, I don't like what he's done to public education. I don't so like. What, what has he done? To, I mean, people well, the don't know major what the governor cuts, has done. Seven, he proposed seven hundred million dollars in education cuts for one he he took money out of retirement out of the 650 million dollars out of the yeah. uh, public retirement benefits and then claimed he had a surplus right you know if i don't pay my mortgage this year at the end of the year i'm going to have a surplus in my bank account <laughs> right. i'm going to have a big <laughs> idea of you in the right. bank knocking right. on my door <laughs> but he took curve. that money out and then claimed he had a surplus so we have to be critical and, and a lot of democrats don't like us going negative and i i, I appreciate that but well, if we can be fact-based personally and going negative and saying he's taking goes. money out of education, we, right. that's we, we need to be fact-based, data-driven. Give, give me three arguments. other things he's done that uh, you think are, are not good for the Commonwealth. Well, he, he came out of the blocks calling the you know the Confederate History Month, I'm recognizing sure. Confederate History Month. Right. He he's pursued efforts uh, to take our surplus, the the president's surplus that he proposed, and then he's screaming about the president spending all this money on surplus. I mean, I, I find that pretty hypocritical. In other words, he's taking the money that he's the, the money using gave it, to Virginia. Cutting right. ribbons around the state for projects that the president funded. Right. And Stimulus we as taxpayers And even, funded. even funding a lawsuit that was thrown out of court by Ken Cuccinelli, I mean, that costs money to mm -hmm. lawyers yeah. to, to challenge, to say, no, I don't want Virginians to have mm -hmm. health care. I want fewer people to have health care mm -hmm. in this state, and we're going to fight and spend well, money to and try to get that. And the duplicity, because I do remember when Ken Cuccinelli filed the health care bill. The Democratic Party of Virginia went up, went out and said, wait a second, how much is this going to cost the taxpayers? Right, taxpayers and, right. and Cuccinelli's office came back with something like, it cost us $40 to file the suit, and we're using staff attorneys 
attorney time. And it like begged the question that if, if the attorneys in the attorney general's office are spending time on this, Why they're they not protecting crime? the consumers <laughs> from all of these exactly. crazy votes. I mean, right. how many people do I know in Nicaragua who are trying to leave me money? Yeah. It's just an amazing situation. <laughs> he's but failed to, he's I mean, there's a lit, uh, failed to recognize sexual orientation. To be against discrimination. Well, the thing that he, he was, got through the, about that was, the regulations was that on here, abortion. Right here, you had the, the colleges all across Virginia. The university said, We don't want to discriminate. Right. And you had Kikucho saying, No, you must discriminate. Right. They're like, We don't want to be well, biased. We don't want to be prejudiced. No, in Virginia, you must be biased. That, well, that's the, the, that's the attorney general. But yeah, in terms true. of the governor, too, that you had Mark well, you Warner and Tim Kaine include sexual orientation right. in right. their in their executive order, and this, right. this governor didn't. So there's a several things that. As Democrats, we can say, you know, he doesn't represent what's best for Virginia. What what could the governor do more? I mean, everyone, Virginia, of course, is in hard times. The whole country's in hard times. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, President Obama is trying at the federal level with the Jobs Act. Republicans are filibustering that. What could be done at the Virginia level more, in your view, to help the economy? Well, he has to attract business to Virginia. And I think you attract business by having a positive business climate. And, And one of the ways to do that is invest in education. Uh, when we made that largest investment in public education in Virginia's history, uh, we also became the number one state in America to do business. When Kim Kaine was governor, he was number one state, n- best managed, best for a child's lifetime success. So when you're out talking to businesses to bring them into Virginia, it's not just about, oh, you know what, we're, n- we're going to give you a tax break. Right. Well, it's also a quality of life issue that, we're, you know what, we're going to have a well-trained, educated workforce to work at your factory or at your business. We're also going to have good public schools so that you can send your kids to school. Well, does, doesn't the rest of the state get that? Because if you look at all the big Fortune 500 country companies that moved recently, mm-hmm. they all came to Fairfax. Yeah. So he that, may get them to the state, but you don't want to end up having to send your kids to school in some of these other parts of the state where you've got folks who are perfectly willing to cut education funding, right. when if they would just go along and increase the funding, improve their schools, they can also then end up bringing jobs into their counties. Mm-hmm. I'd be curious yeah. to... Uh, and then uh, Fairfax, let's give tip yeah. our hat, hat to Jerry Connolly and Sharon Bolivar and, and the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. And thankfully that, we didn't lose the school board this right. time. And, either, so. you know, Fairfax is, is well run. It has a lot of amenities. When, you, when um, you know, uh, Worldwide Volkswagen came, uh, Hilton, Hilton Hotels came. came. I mean, there was a lot of attractions to Fairfax County. And, and uh, so, you know, hats off to them. Tip, tip of the hat to those uh, local elected officials right. as well. On the same day as Virginia's election, uh, Ohio voters went mm. to the polls mm. and defeated by strong margins, something like 60-40, a profound anti-union measure. I mean, what, the amazing thing is here you had a Republican governor, mm-hmm. Republican legislature in Ohio, mm. and they said unions can't have collective bargaining, public mm. sector unions. Mm. And the people of Ohio rose up and said, that's ridiculous. Unions said they have to have a voice. In Wisconsin, of course, uh, two recall elections have succeeded. I have no doubt, I'm willing to bet it right here, that Scott Walker will no longer be governor of Wisconsin in a year, because the people of Wisconsin are rising up to protect their workers. We haven't seen a lot of that in Virginia. And, And the thing that strikes me is if you look at polls, you see the voters support collective bargaining, they support teachers, they support firefighters, they support police officers, they recognize these are valued members of the community that do a valuable job. You, you mentioned, for example, teachers' pensions. Uh, Governor McDonald rating their pensions to say that he oh, has a surplus. Oh, we've also laid off 1,200 teachers, well, by they, the way. There so. you go. So why isn't that particular Not message? Weird. They, I understand. <laughs> no, I understand. The governor of Virginia yeah. has... Virginia has these messages are working in Ohio is a purple state, yeah. Wisconsin is a purple state, Virginia is a purple state. Mm-hmm. Why are these messages resonating mm-hmm. in Ohio and Wisconsin, and what can we do to get those same messages mm-hmm. resonating in Virginia? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Mark. I think it has a lot to do with the, those are rights that were already embedded in the culture there. People understood them, and there was an issue of fundamental fairness. They came in, tried to ramrod, you know, Quick, you know, didn't go on to go through the process. Wanted quick votes. Didn't want public input to strip uh, those workers right. of their rights. Whereas in Virginia, they don't have them now. So yeah. trying to impose them, trying to uh, provide those rights, uh, rights. But even just cutting teachers. Tougher. I mean, you, you mentioned 1,200 teachers were laid off. Uh, their pensions were raided to balance yeah. the budget. It, all public it, employees. Yeah. yeah all, all public employees, not just teachers. Yeah. But my point is that Americans across the nation. Yeah 
the majority of them support their public servants, to right. support teachers. We see that not just in the blue states, but in the purple states. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the turnout was very low in this election, as it always is in these mm -hmm. odd-year elections. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I've said this to you off the air, I hate the odd-year elections. I want to bring Virginia into the even-year fold if I ever have an issue. That, that, that'll be my personal one. But it seems to me that in order to increase turnout, you need to let the people of Virginia know what's happening to public employees in Virginia who mm -hmm. aren't doing so well right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that would be a message that you think Virginia could take mm -hmm. into 2012 and 2013. I think that'll be debated, uh, you know, um, as one of the issues. Uh, I think it really that fundamental fairness is what struck people the wrong way. American people are very, very fair. And whether they support collective bargain or don't, they really didn't like the process where those rights are stripped away. and uh, All it is is a right to negotiate. It's yeah. not a guarantee of a oh, benefit. I, I, it's, I it's remember, all it is, is is to say, let us have a seat at the I table. I remember I sponsored uh, meet and, uh, they didn't want meet and confer. That So I said, all right, let's meet and discuss. <laughs> I, I put in a bill to say, let's let them meet and discuss. Right. Can't confer, but we can discuss. discuss. Oh, we went through all sorts of gyrations to try to give at, at least a meeting, really, and not not Binding arbitration or right. you know right just to strike let the just people let them have work. a discussion at the table to help uh, right you know communication is always is that never going to happen in Virginia is that no, I wouldn't say never I it's it's a it tough, won't happen I will it's guarantee an it won't happen this year well that's for sure <laughs> for the next well, now, legislature we had a whole thing and the and clearly the Republicans were overreaching they were going to take eight to seats yeah. in the Senate they were going to just decimate us everywhere. We, everywhere we walked, they were taking everything. And they didn't, which is the good side. That's, That's the silver the good, lining. good news. Is that also the harbinger for next year? Because we've got a big national election. We're going to have a lot bigger turnout. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Yeah, we I, did? I'm still very bullish about next year. I, I think we have a tremendous candidate for the United States Senate with Tim Kaine. I think he's, he'll even cross partisan lines. Absolutely. Think, he always has. Uh, he always he has. Always has. Always has. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that, I've already seen negative attack ads, Republicans running attack ads on Tim Kaine. Um, and then of course the presidential race. Uh, the Republicans refuse to support Mitt Romney. Right. They, they, they continue <laughs> to try to find but anybody Mitt but Mitt Romney. <laughs> That's right. And they've gone through some doozies. So <laughs> They're running out of candidates. They, they are. In the lead. As they are. I have to <laughs> assume they're going to finally <laughs> land on Mitt Romney. <laughs> land on somebody. And, and so that'll be a competitive race uh, throughout the country and certainly here in Virginia where it's battleground. I'm still uh, convinced uh, Barack Obama can win Virginia, and obviously we're going to do everything we can to make sure that happens. Brian Moran, chair of the Democratic Party of Virginia, I have a meet the press question for you. Uh -huh. oh, God. Will you or will you not be a candidate for governor in 2013? I will not. No? No. Why not? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I endorsed you. I think you'd Thank be a terrific you. governor. No, you're, very, uh, you, you're definitely not. You're I'm very, people's Tim Russell questions. No, that, There's no, no, no hesitation. No I'm not going to try and save you here, Brian, but you're on your own. No hesitation. No. <laughs> That's too bad. Well, you're I'm very kind to, to say that. that. Thank you. I, I'm trying to build this party. We have some work to do, and uh, we, have, we have great elections coming. That is the one thing about Virginia. We have an election every it's year. That's true. So let's get back, folks. Right. If let's, you don't let's get it one year, work. the next one's right around the corner. Let's get back to work. Well, I want to thank you, Brian, for coming. Great. No, I appreciate and, it. Um, thank you. Please stay tuned. We're going to talk about some Republican dirty tricks oh. that they came out with in this election. Stay with us. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One day some matches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask? 
for a little precipitation. Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton, and with me is Mark Levine, and we're going to talk about some interesting happenings in the last couple of weeks of the election this year, which in Virginia we really haven't seen a lot of. We certainly haven't seen a lot of it in northern Virginia, and it's what we're sort of generically calling dirty tricks. The thing about dirty tricks is we try to focus on them prior to the campaign because right. they might influence the campaign, but sometimes something's come up and you don't find out about them until it's too late. Until it's too late. And, and then a lot of news organizations don't focus on them because they no. say, well, it's old yeah. news, and yet if you don't focus on them, right. they can repeat them in the future. Well, and it's also the type of thing, and what happened, the first thing that came up in Northern Virginia was a sudden uh, texting to the leadership in the Fairfax Democratic with Committee. With new technology comes new dirty tricks. With new dirty tricks, and was crashing people's phones. And you, I'm sure, remember in the, about two years ago in New Hampshire they That's tried right. this, and they crashed it down on election day. What they did is they had a phone bank for people trying to get people out. That's both parties do right. it. It's perfectly normal. And uh, the Republicans called into the New Hampshire Democratic uh, place, and they they they. They crashed the system. They crashed the phones. And this actually ended up to be a criminal action, and people went to jail for that in New Hampshire. What happened here in Virginia? Well, we had an activist in our Springfield area who got a ton of these text messages and has actually filed suit. Virginia has an anti-spamming law, and if you are the recipient of one of these texts, for each one that you received, it's a $500 to $1,500 fine. Wow. So... Uh, and I would think that, again, this is not a spam message for some product that you don't want to no, buy. No. This is a purposely driven political way to shut down an, someone's phones someone's on election phone, day. And it also was spreading a lot of disinformation. And interestingly enough, one of the senator Senate candidates they went after was Dave Marsden, and his opponent was a man named um, Jason Flannery. And the lawsuit contends that it is a company associated with Jason Flannery. Do we know it's from his campaign, or could it just be someone? The spamming campaign that? is denying it, but apparently there have been other instances where his company was associated with these types of things. So I guess they'll find out in the lawsuit. They are encouraging anybody who got these kinds of messages to go ahead and file Come suit, forward. and it's five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. The um, a lot of the messages were very inflammatory against Dave Marsden and highly misleading and all of that kind of stuff. And the fortunately, the Democrats got the word out fairly rapidly that this was going on so that at least there was some contemporaneous coverage of it. Right. But it was that was just the first. The first of You know, this happens every election. I'll never forget uh, in Maryland, when, and it's not Virginia, but I remember when they had a, a they had they, they had this endorsement thing where they had a number of African Americans who were, did not endorse the, the governor or like, and yet they, they claimed they did, and we had to run out and say no, that people are spreading this or false, and the governor's wife went to homeless shelters to bring people out. To, so, so these things happen every election. Uh, in this case, in Virginia, there was something in nursing homes, I think. Oh, gosh, yes. And this was this was just amazing. There was a robo-dial that was put into... Now, robo-dial. For, robo for those that for don't those speak don't politiques. <laughs> those are those annoying recorded messages. I hate those. I hate them, and when I see the numbers come through, I don't even listen to them anymore. But they sent them into a retirement community. Now, one of the facts that are out there is older people vote in a much greater proportion they than do. the rest of them. And they are very democratic in their votes. And a phone Many of them are living on Social Security. Yes, which well, they, there is Which that. they seem to remember the Democrats support and the Republicans want to shut it down. That's so right. So there, there is, is a reason why they're good Democratic voters. That's exactly right. And they sent in a robo-dial into this retirement community saying that, well, this was going to be a low turnout year, and so there was no need for them to come and vote that the Democrats would a not need them. A low turnout year, so therefore don't vote. Right, because apparently we would have enough people without you because there weren't <laughs> enough folks on the other side, and so you didn't need to come out and vote. Uh -huh. And then they sent in another one that suggested 
that um, which was very contradictory to the first one, which was if you didn't want to have to wait in line on Tuesday, you could vote on Monday. Which, of course, was not true. No, but we understand that a number of people in their wheelchairs, oh, no. because the, the, this particular retirement community oh, has no. its own precinct. It's so big so that they, you they vote So they rolled there over to the precinct and tried to vote. And tried to vote on Monday. And were not allowed to vote. No, because, you know. Hopefully they were told to come back the next day. I, yes, and what I know the Democrats did was they sent a robo-dial into the same community saying, don't be fooled, but we do we need know you. who's behind this kind of thing? Because these happen every single year. They happen every election. I want to see people punished. I don't care whether they're Democrats or Republicans. These kinds of dirty tricks should stop. Well, to the extent that the, the lawsuit can prove that Jason Flannery, who was an actual Republican mm -hmm. candidate, is behind the Texas, uh, that's certainly the case. And with the robo-dials, they're trying to back it through to see who that is. We do know that the infamous um, Halloween Obama zombie with a bullet in his head was actually put out by the Loudoun County Republican Committee itself. So there's now, no me, ambiguity Well, let me just that. say this about that. I, I, I obviously, I think that's atrocious. I also think that people have a First Amendment right to say just about anything about the President of the United States. As much as I decry that, and I think they're, they're wrong to do so, I will defend their right to do that. So if they want to say Obama's a zombie, whatever, uh, it's you know. It's not the zombie, Mark. That okay. Got it. It's right. the bullet hole. Ah, it's the bullet hole that leads to. To people promoting yes, violence. Yes, to actually. promoting violence. Against, and it is um, a fact that it is against federal law to threaten the life of, of the, the president, president right. or to that encourage other people to do that. Right. And, and that's we, really. We all what, remember when Sarah Palin had a, a, a flyer out with. Targets yes. over people's district, including Gabby Gifford, so who, who then got shot. So yes, yes. there are. Even if the vast majority of Americans understand that to be a metaphor, a bullet hole, a target, there right. are certainly unstable types who might take that very seriously. Well, and we have unfortunately a history of people attacking the president. No, that's true. I mean, it goes all the way back, you know, obviously into the 1800s, but more recently we've had a number of people and a number of elected officials, Gabby Gifford being the latest who you you know you put this out there and it has consequences mm -hmm. with people who maybe are not as stable right. as you would think right. uh, I know the Secret Service was reported at, at actually looking into it they are charged with protecting the president and they take extremely seriously anything that they think could lead someone to try and harm the president so uh, there is this example there's the nursing homes mm -hmm. there's text messages what else do we know oh we have a wonderful card and what i do just want to say yep. um, about the zombie president yep. thing that i found so amazing um, first of all the, the chair of the loudon county committee was like we have um you know we're just joking, and everybody knows. Maybe we joking. can show that picture up I on think the screen. We've got it. As, Do we as, have it? As, 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 keep, keep talking, keep Bettina. Keep The other we'll thing the that screen. I found very interesting, though, is you had a number of Republicans saying, "Yes, Ooh, there it is." Oh, that's yeah. awful. Is that you know so clever, clever, clever? You know, it's you're right. It's the bullet hole. That's, it's the bullet I mean, hole. I mean, that's they, can, the they can make the president as ghoulish as they want. Right. It's, I think it's frankly, right. extremely disrespectful, and yeah. you know, you can disagree with the president's policies without making him otherworldly, and, but the bullet hole is particularly... It is, and I'm not a zombie expert, but I'm, <laughs> not, I'm, I'm not, I will confess. I, I, I'm glad to hear that, actually. Yeah, well, you know, there's a whole subculture, I understand, of zombie, and... and I, I didn't know that. Yes, I'm not there sure are, I wanted to are. know that, but, but uh, that's yes. okay. I can tell I had uh, children. <laughs> I can tell you there's a whole zombie thing okay. that goes down. Uh, but they don't usually have bullet holes in their heads. So That's it's not, it's not, it's not even part that of the. Uh, nice. The amazing thing that I do we know who did that poster? It was the Loudoun County Demo Republican Committee. So there's no doubt about it. They the Loudoun County Republican Committee. The Loudoun County wants Republican. to put a bullet hole in the president of the United States. Well, if you believe what they put out there, that's what they did. They put it on the poster and then said, you know, "Oh, it's I, I got to say, I remember." Okay. Uh, there were there were Democrats. I mean, not even so many Democrats, frankly, but people in protests against the Iraq War that put up Bush's Hitler signs, and I condemned those at the time, and I was not a fan of President Bush, but you, you don't right. call, and there are people in the Tea Party who put up Obama as Hitler, right. and I said, that's ridiculous, but those were individuals, you know, and Americans have a right to free speech, they can say these mm -hmm. atrocious things, I condemn them, and speech fight speech, but for the Loudoun County Republican Party, right, to do an it. official organization, not some wacko in Loudoun County, no. but no, no, no. the official Republican Party, to put out a poster of the president with a hole in his head, 
I think tells you something about the Loudoun County Republican Party. Well, it really does. And people need to understand that that's who did it. That it isn't, as you say, some individual person right. who thought they were being cute. This was an actual publication, a poster that was put out by the Republican Party in Loudoun County. Which, of course, as we talked with Brian, has no elected Democrats left, which tells you something about Loudoun County, I suppose. I, I don't. I bring back Loudoun County, folks. If you're in Loudoun <laughs> County and you're watching this show, um, I can't think that you would support this. And so I just think it needs to just get more turnout right. in Loudoun County. Well, the thing that amazed me was that you had various and sundry Republicans saying, "Oh, this is a terrible thing; it shouldn't happen." The governor, Bob McDonnell, condemned it through a spokesman. He couldn't just through, sort a of, spokesman. through a spokesman. He couldn't just sort of stand up there and let you record Governor McDonald saying this is a terrible thing. Don't do it. It was his spokesman. Um, I do want to go. There's one more that we have, and we have this. I'm pretty sure we have it that we can put up on the screen. It's the um, email. It's the postcard that came out from something called um, Our Heritage. Is that the name of this thing? Our Heritage USA. Yes, it is up there. Our Heritage USA. Yes, and it. That's says, probably some Chinese corporation. That is a cor- <laughs> that is a corporation, and you will see it. Well, because they, they never tell you who these who these people are. Well, they don't. And you know, when it came out, uh, Patrick Forrest was a fellow who ran as a Republican against Senator Janet Howell, okay. who is a Democrat. Okay. And it turns out. Um, and I find this out from these kinds of publications, um, and Patrick Forrest acknowledges that he is openly homosexual. Mm-hmm. He's gay. And so this card is put out by something called Our Heritage USA. When Patrick Forrest said, well, clearly this is my opponent, they went and tried to find Our Heritage USA and discovered that there is no such company like that in operation in Virginia. Well, you can't put out a postcard Yes, you for, can. For, for a company that doesn't exist? Yes, you can. You can go and pay for it. And there's an address in Lynchburg, which should immediately tell you, since Lynchburg is not a Democratic stronghold, that this right. is not a Democratic effort. Right. So they went and they you know, got on the Google map right, kind of right. a thing to see what was at that address, uh-huh. and it turns out there's nothing there. So, so, so basically, let me focus. get this straight. So you have a gay Republican claiming the Democrats did an anti-gay attack on him. Yes. Out of a storefront that no one seems to be able to find in Lynchburg, Virginia, a Republican town. Yes. In other words, it sounds like Patrick Forrest has some Republicans masquerading as Democrats. It would certainly seem that way. And it, it has his, his headline saying he's coming out of the liberal closet. And you're better off voting for a Democrat than a homosexual you know, Republican. You Democrats don't usually attack people for being gay or attack people from the right. I, that's not something no. that you find progressives doing very often. And as someone who's been to Occupy Wall Street recently, I can assure you they are a very diverse crowd, very accepting of people of all yeah. sexual orientations and races and religions yeah. and everything. It like makes that. absolutely no sense to yeah, think that this would come from Democrats. That is very strange. But created a lot I'm of controversy. Tough, it looks like. We are done. And this was fabulous. It was, it was nice to actually be on with you. Exactly. And not not just exactly. uh, trading weeks. Exactly, we love it. And uh, we will have uh, the regular Inside Scoop and Inside Scoop Virginia on every Monday at 7 p.m., dealing with all kinds of national state issues, and I hope you'll join me in. You can find out more information on my website at marklevine.tv.